Well, today is a very special day for us as a church family. We will enjoy tonight our inaugural Castletown church meeting tonight at 5.30 at Castletown Civic Center. We will have the very first of our Castletown congregation meetings. And for the next four months, we will have one meeting each month. And then early in 2018, we will go to a weekly meeting. But tonight, if, uh, if you can come and come and support and come and enjoy and come and pray, if you can't make it, then do pray still for whatever God will be doing in Castletown as we join with other Christians there already to advance the kingdom of Christ Jesus in that place. We also kick off a new series today titled 24-7. And for the next six weeks, starting next week, we will be in the book of Romans, specifically Romans chapter 12. So if I may encourage you over the next few weeks in your quiet times, please do get into Romans chapter 12, read Romans 11, 12 and 13, but primarily chapter 12, so that you can fill your heart and fill your mind and stir your spirit with what we're going to be talking about, as Paul will unpack for us in Romans chapter 12 what it looks like to be a Christian, not every now and again, but every single day of our lives, 24-7. And so today, we're going to look at the gospel. Owen spoke very much this morning about Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. You would have heard him say that a few times. You also would have heard Owen say a few times, thank you, Jesus, for saving us. But what is he saving us from? That's what we'll be exploring today. The reality of the gospel And you may note from your outline, if you received an outline this morning coming through the back of the building or the front of the building, that it looks a little bit different from every week's outline. I have put down on the first page of your notice sheet the actual scriptures that tells the story of the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus. Every single Christian should have this message in their heart. I would encourage you to look at it, to read it, to memorize it, and to above all share it. This is ultimately what we are called to do, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, with as many as possible. So I'll start with this. I want to tell you about a story of father and son who deeply and dearly love one another. Throughout the boy's young life, the father did everything in his power to raise his young son, this young boy, in a manner that is integrous and honest, and for him to be an example to his friends around him. This father loved this boy very much, and being a high court judge, finding himself in the public eye, it was important for him that his son was raised in the best of ways. He was a very busy man, but he always made time to spend with his boy. And so he would take him on adventures. He would go to his school sports initiatives. He would take him fishing. And whenever he could, he would help him with his homework. In a world where this father heard story after story, day in and day out, of injustice and pain and murder and theft and violence and petty crime and civil and corporate disputes, day after day, his son was a welcome distraction. His son was a a, a ray of light for him in a world that to him seemed very crooked and very broken. The father was there when the boy graduated high school, super proud of him, and so excited to go and drop him off, um, him off for university when he would start that part of his journey in life. In his first year in university, university this boy befriended a young lady who would lead him astray. When uh, he finally scraped up enough courage to ask her out, and she said yes, they enjoyed the most amazing day together. 
At night, he took her out to a restaurant, and they were getting to know each other. It was so good. And, and one glass of wine turned into two glasses of wine that turned into four glasses of wine. And they didn't realize how much they were consuming as they were enjoying each other's company so much. Later that night on their way home, driving in the car, having the time of his life, the boy thought, I may very well be falling for her. This may very well be the one for me. And in one moment, the unthinkable happened. In a moment, a lapse of concentration as he looked from the road towards the girl. And his attention was broken. He ran a red light. And when he hit the car that was crossing the road, he instantaneously killed the mother and her two children in the car. Everything fell apart. A few weeks later, when he was brought before the judge for sentencing, it turned out to be his father. This father still loved his son with his whole heart. But the father, as an appointed judge of the people, had to carry out justice. He would have to sentence his own boy. The love that he had for the boy wasn't the issue in this moment. Justice prevailing was what was important. His heart was saying to him, couldn't you just this once look the other way? Couldn't you just this once let it slide? In a world so full of criminals, so full with bad people, surely your son, my son, who didn't do this thing on purpose, surely to let him go free would not be such a bad thing. But he couldn't. You see, if he didn't pass sentence, if he didn't judge fairly, if there wasn't consequences for actions, then the judge would become as guilty as the son who committed the crime. You see, when the judge doesn't pass sentence, the crime doesn't go away. It actually perpetuates and becomes bigger in nature. Justice demands consequence for wrongdoing. It doesn't matter how much the father loved his son, there must be consequences for all the actions. Do you see that if this father, the judge, didn't act, the sin of the child would have become his? It's a painful story, isn't it? It's a difficult story to hear. But do you know something? It's my story. And it's your story. This is a story about us. Let me explain. The Bible teaches us that God is absolutely holy and flawless in every conceivable way. He is perfection. Therefore, when mankind rebelled against God, when mankind sinned against Him, God is the maker of heaven and earth, the ultimate judge of the universe could not just look the other way because the sin of mankind would then have been attributed to him. And he is holy. He would always be holy. God's love for his creation never ever waned or changed from the moment that he created Adam and Eve. From the moment sin entered the world, God love, His love remained constant. He loves you in this moment absolutely. And nothing that you can ever do can change that love that He has for you. The Bible actually says that God loves the whole world. Isn't it true in John 3, 16? That He sent Jesus, why? Because He loved the world. But He has to and He will judge sin. And there will be consequences for the things that we do wrong because he is absolutely holy and he cannot become a partaker of the sin that mankind perpetuates. If he doesn't hold us accountable, if he looks the other way, he becomes party to our wrongdoing. Will he ever love you less? I say no. Will there be justice for the sin in our lives? The Bible says 
Yes. Now let me explain why this should let the hair on the back of your neck stand up. When God created the world, he saw that everything he made was good. He, he, he looked at his creation, he said, everything is good. Uh, right at the beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning of this book, God created and he looked and he said, man, this works, this is great. But somewhere between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3, something went wrong in the heavenlies. There was a rebellion in the heavenlies. And Satan and some who would belong to him was cast out of God's presence. He, in the form of a serpent, would come and tempt Eve in Genesis 3, verse 1 to 5. You can read about that. And the New Testament speaks about this in two places, that God would then take what had been happening in the heavenly realm, the action of the angels having rebelled against him, and that he would hold them to account. There's a guy called Peter, and he writes the following. He says, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. But he cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, on occasion would write, and he says, The angels that did not keep their own position but left their proper dwelling have been kept by him in eternal chains in the nether gloom until the judgment of the great day. Both Peter and Jude speaks about angels having rebelled and having become hostile opponents towards God and towards that which belongs to God. Of these rebellious angels, Satan is chief. He is the originator of sin. And his aim is to try and destroy everything God holds dear. Have you ever wondered why Satan would come against mankind so vehemently, so consistently? It's because you're made in the image of God, and he hates God, and he would do everything he can, not being able to destroy God, to destroy that which God loves most, which happens to be you and I. The Bible teaches us that God prepared a lake of fire and sulfur where Satan and all who belong to him will in future be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And it's difficult for us to grasp because we are, in this side of eternity, temporal beings. For us, there's always an end. But God says no, forever and ever in the life after this. And this lake of fire is created not just for Satan, but all who would belong to him. In Revelations 20, verse 12 to 15, you can turn your Bibles to this passage. I would like for you to read this with me. It says the following. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into this lake of fire. Jesus says the day is coming when he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and for his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are the words of Jesus. And so what is hell? What is this eternal punishment that Jesus speaks about, that the Bible speaks about? Why don't we hear more about it? Why aren't people talking about it today within Christian circles and within the church? Why is this such a silent subject, given that the Bible has so much to say about it? What is hell? Well, the Bible is actually full of the scriptures and explaining of, uh, uh, regarding hell what it is. But I chose this morning to just take three things regarding what Jesus says about it. 
from his mouth. And this is the first thing that he would say. He would say this, hell is eternal. Jesus parallels eternal life with eternal punishment. So that the first thing we see is the concept of this state of being that has no end. There will be a heaven without end and there will be a hell without end. And the Bible says of those who belong to Satan and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast. So we see that both heaven and hell is without end, Jesus would tell his listeners. The second thing Jesus helps us to understand about hell is that those who go there are conscious. They know where they are. They understand where they find themselves. And he does this by telling us the story in Luke chapter 16. And he says the following. He says, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abram far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. Jesus explains that hell is eternal. And that those who are there will know exactly where they find themselves. And the third thing is this, torment. Jesus says, I will send my angels and they will gather out of my kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says hell is a place where the worm doesn't die and the fire never, never goes out. Earlier this week, Rhiannon and I went to uh, have our tires changed um, at one of the garages in Douglas. And we started a conversation with, I think, the general manager there or uh, the owner of the business. And at one point in time, he turned to us and he said, you know, I do so many things wrong. I'm definitely going to go to hell. He said, I'm going to go to where all my friends are. We're going to go have a good time there. And you know, it just, it just hit me. This man has no understanding of what hell is. And I thought, do we understand? We who are supposed to be the bringers of good news. Don't get me wrong. You know, we are supposed to be filled with joy. And you'll see in a moment why. But we are quick to say Jesus saves, but we never tell people what they're getting saved from. Torment. I am the biggest ladies blouse in here. Let me confess. I have the lowest threshold for pain. When something goes wrong with me, I'm a little bit, I think me and Esther, my little girl, we share that. We cry at the thought of something that may hurt in future. I was trying to think of the time I got hurt most severely. And actually, I got hurt quite often, actually. There was a lot of examples, so I didn't know which one to give to you guys. But I will say this, that whenever I get hurt, I endure because I know it'll come to an end. It doesn't matter how bad it is in the moment. I know that by tomorrow, I think I'll, I'll, I think I'll do it. I think I'll get through. I think I'll get through. Actually, I'll tell you. It's coming to mind. I think the most recent, most serious pain I ever had, I told Chris. I, had a C, I, had a, I nearly said a C-section. I didn't have a C-section. <laughs> I, I had a hernia operation that the doctor said is the male equivalent of a C-section. Ladies are saying no. <laughs> oh my word and I, I woke up in hospital and as I woke I needed to go to the loo you know and I asked the nurse can I get off the bed and uh, she said Yana you can go you're ready you stitch up you can go and I swung my legs down I got off the bed and when my feet touched the ground Satan himself took a hot poker and shoved it through my side I blacked out they picked me up off the floor the pain was so severe You guys don't believe me. I endured because I knew this can't go on forever. It doesn't matter how bad it is. This can't go on forever. 
Jesus is trying very, very hard in Scripture to help us understand the concept of this won't end. This is forever. The worst, the worst you can think of will never come to an end. And it boggles my mind. And I know our knee-jerk reaction is this. Listen, I'm not such a bad person. This isn't fair. How can God afflict eternal punishment on sin that happens just in a moment? It's not right. And I start thinking thoughts like this. I'm such a good person and I forget about the lies that I've told in my life. And I forget about the times that I was envious in my life. And I forget about the times where I should have helped somebody and I didn't help them. And I forget about all the thoughts that run through my mind constantly that dishonors God. I forget about the times that I look the other way when I could have helped somebody, uh, you know, when, whenever I screamed at my children or my wife or I stole or I lied or I cheated. And I tell myself I'm not such a bad person. But if you sit back and you think, I want to show you this, just so that you understand, the weight of sin is so severe to God. The sin we sometimes promote or allow within our households and within our own lives is so severe to God, so offensive to a being that is completely holy that He decided the punishment for it is eternal. Think about that for a moment. We think eternal consequent or conscious torment is a punishment disproportionate to the crime simply because we cannot comprehend how offensive our sin truly is to God. In Revelation, we see a great multitude of people who's around the throne. They are now without sin. They are now perfect like Jesus. They are without partiality. They are seeing what, she, what God is busy doing. And we read here in Revelation 19, 1 to 2. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgment is just and right. You see, they see something we can't comprehend just yet. They in heaven sit around God saying, the way He's judging is right. The eternal consequences for sin, they cry out, is just. The great American theologian Jonathan Edwards sums it up like this in his essay, The Justice of God in the Damnation of Sinners. Edwards, Edwards would argue that because God is a being of infinite greatness, majesty and glory, He is therefore infinitely honorable and worthy of absolute obedience. Sin against God, being a violation of infinite obligations, must be a crime infinitely heinous and deserving of infinite punishment. Jesus asked on one occasion, what would it be worth if a man gained the whole world and lost his soul? Let me explain something to you in this moment. Here's what happens to me. I would see a pretty lady and I'll get tempted to think things I shouldn't think about her in the moment. Or I'll see a car drive by that I think, I, I should have a car like that. Or I will see a friend with a lifestyle that I would go like, I, I would like to have and I covet that lifestyle. And I get tempted by these things. Perhaps you get tempted by different things as well. Satan took Jesus and showed him all temptation at once saying you can have every woman, you could have all riches, you could have all these cities if you would bow down and worship me. And Jesus, understanding the consequences of sin, would say something like this, what good is it if I get everything, everything this world has to offer and I lose my soul? Hell is the loss of soul, a reality so terrible that Scripture uses a variety of ways to describe it. If you were to read your Bible cover to cover, you will see that the Bible describes this place like words like an abyss or a lake of fire, the blackest darkness, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
It's a separation from God. And this is ultimately the worst. Not the torment, not the pain, not the deepest, darkest blackness, not being in the realm of Satan and all that belongs to him, but utter separation from God. Why is this a big thing, you may ask? You see, the Bible teaches us that he makes his sun to shine on the good and the evil, and his rain to fall on the just and the unjust here, in the here and the now. That means whether you are a lover of Christ Jesus or you've utterly rejected Jesus and all that is religion, you still walk within the grace and favor and mercy of God while you're here on earth. Earlier this week, Chris and I were speaking about Richard Hawkins, perhaps in this season, one of atheists' greatest champions, a calloused, angry, bitter man against all that is God and Christianity and religion at large. But when he wakes up in the moment, he still enjoys the favor of the Lord. He can still see. He can hear. He can smell. The Bible says our very breath is from the hand of God. He can walk out his front door and go and enjoy nature. He can go and start an adventure. He can have friendship. He can have love. He can listen to music. He can read poetry. There's so much in this life that is of God that people can enjoy, not even knowing that God is giving it to them freely as a gift because he loves them. But you see, in the year after, the separation between that which is good and that which is evil is ultimate. There is no crossover. That means that you will be with God and everything that is good for eternity, or you will be with Satan and all who belongs to him apart from everything that is good for eternity. There's a complete absence of God and all that is his. Hell is not so much about a location, but about the absence of a holy God. Dear saint, people need to know about Jesus. We have to tell people about this. You see, what we tend to do is come up to our friends, our family, our loved ones. I do this all the time and I say, you know what? You really need God because he loves you so much. And you know what happens? They go like, yeah, you know what? I'm such a great guy. I'm not surprised. I am lovable. It's, it's awesome. I'm still going to live my life the way I want to live my life. What we have to do is help people understand there's a consequence for not taking the free gift of Christ Jesus. And the consequence is so severe that I don't care if you think I'm awkward or weird or strange. I need you to hear this. You must hear what will happen if you don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because it's so wild. Even if I lose this friendship, at least you know. And you can make an informed decision. You see, we'll come with these mighty angels, the Bible says. In flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who obey or refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from His glorious power. It's right in here. We never, ever speak about it. Earlier this week, a good friend of mine and perhaps a good friend of yours, Jonathan King's father, passed away. And you know, I spoke to him. I got in contact with him. And, and he said to me, the worst thing is this. My father didn't know Jesus. The worst thing is not that he's dead. The worst thing is that he died without Jesus. Are we carrying such a burden for our fathers and our mothers, our friends, our children, it is so right that we tell people about God's love. We should never stop telling them, but we're not giving them the whole picture. How is this state of eternal conscious torment utterly separated from God? And who is going to hell? Everyone, everywhere born on this earth. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether you want to accept this or not, the Bible makes this statement, everyone has fought, uh, sinned and falls short of the glory of God. You know, as a young 18-year-old, I was an avid rock climber. 
On occasion, I was with my friends at a place called Waterfall Boven. We owned a farm in this area. Waterfall Boven is a place in southern Africa that's got a high uh, location, a high concentration of climbing routes all in one area. It's world famous. Red Bull send their teams. There are loads of international guys go and climb there. You have from the smallest little bouldering little routes to significant difficult gradings that guys go and enjoy and they go and climb. We were hiking along the base of a canyon this one day. I wonder if you can see that. It, it looks like that if you've never been there before. The rock's red like that. And me and two friends were hiking along the bottom of a canyon just like that. Just a lovely summer's day out. When we saw about a 40-meter rock face, three people standing on the top in the distance. We were hiking towards them. And as we were hiking towards them, I saw the first guy strap in, got the rope through the figure of eight, you know, attached to his harness, round the back, dropped the rope. He was clearly the most experienced. He was going to abseil first, get to the bottom. And there's a certain nonchalance, you know, that comes with guys who've done it many times. I don't know if any of you have abseiled or rock climbed before. You know, uh, you can see the difference between a guy who knows what he's doing. He, he kind of swings huge arches and he goes down very, very quick. And before, you know, we could count to 10, he'd come, sail down this, this rock face, and he was now at the bottom. And I could see he was preparing himself. He was going to do something that was called tightrope, meaning that when the next person comes down, he would have the rope. If anything were to go wrong, he would just pull the rope tight, and the rope, having been fed through this thing called a figure of eight, will just lock, and the person won't be able to fall. And so we were coming and we, we were probably as far away now from here to where that wall is from this guy. And we thought from a place of courtesy we'll stop because otherwise we'll need to hug the cliff face and walk underneath the rope. So we'll just wait for the, for the next person to come down and then we'll go through, right? Can you guys see this in your mind's eye? And so I could see the next person coming down is not as confident as the guy who's just come down. I could see she's moving a little bit with nerves, you know, she's checking her equipment and rechecking her equipment, uh, you know, and she's, she's just making sure everything is as it should, and the guy in front of her is giving her assurance and everything, and she's got the rope through, and there's this moment if you abseil, if you've never done it before, that just makes your heart beat faster and your blood run cold. It's that moment where you're strapped in, right, and you put all your weight and your trust in the cheapest equipment you could afford. And you lean back and that rope tightens up and now you're hanging, you're suspended over the cliff edge. In this moment, this girl is hanging on a rope as thick as my finger. The only thing between her and death is a rope as thick as my finger. You know, the Bible says that there's only one way to escape hell. There's only one way to be saved. It's through Christ Jesus. Saved from what? Everything we spoke about today. Let me tell you, as just a normal man, I don't have the capacity to explain eternal torment and hell to you in what it truly is. But it's horrific in the worst imaginable way, and that would just be the start of it. Jesus saves us from that. There's only one thing stood between an eternity there with Satan and all who belongs to him, and you, and it's Jesus. His name is Jesus. Because Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so me and my friends are stood and we're watching this girl as she's come over the, the edge, over the lip. And, and we're thinking, Yo, you know what, she doesn't look like she's very experienced at all. She actually just looks super, super nervous. And what would unfold in the next few moments would be some of the most horrific moments of my life. As we were looking, it just suddenly seemed that she was suspended in midair. And then she fell. Completely silently. And as far from here to that wall, she hit the ground with such ferocity 
that she bounced and landed again face down in the ground. I remember looking at this guy like, this didn't really happen. You see, her harness had torn. Her harness had come away from the rope. Jesus is your rope. I want you to understand that there is nothing in this life more important than Jesus Christ. And that your life is surrendered to Him. Not your career. Not your bank balance. Not your friends. Not your husband or your wife or your children. Or your greatest dreams. The greatest, most important thing in this life is that rope. That's keeping you from a hell that you deserve and I deserve. If that girl knew what awaited her, I believe she would have worn five harnesses. She would have tied that rope around her waist. She would have ripped it around her arms and her legs. I think she would have bitten onto it if she knew what was going to happen in the next few moments. There would have been no nonchalance about it. That rope would have been the central most important thing in her life. And let me tell you something. This is exactly how the Bible teaches us we should be regarding the author and perfecter of our faith. The only one who could save us. If you want to see how real hell truly is, look at the cross and the horrific price that Jesus was willing to pay to save us from that reality. Because in the cross is is contained the truth of the severity of the judgment that awaits all apart from Jesus. I want to conclude with this. God loves this world. So he's made a way to save us from the hell we deserve. You see, our friends and family would come and say, I'll never ever believe in a God who would send people to hell. I cannot believe in a God who would condemn people to eternal damnation. And I'm saying you're missing the point. God is a loving God who would save you from the hell you deserve. You're going there anyway. Sin in your nature and in this fallen world has made that your destination. You're with Satan and all that belongs to him, the Bible would say. But God loved you so much that he said, I will not leave you to that reality. I will make a way for you to be saved. I'll give my son Jesus to come and live the perfect life and never once sin. And then he will willingly go to the cross for you. He will willingly become a substitute He will willingly die so that you can live. And in the death of Christ Jesus, my wrath will be satisfied, the Bible would say. The price for the sin of mankind was paid. And God raised Jesus from the dead after three days. And Jesus gave his life for you and for me. And the Bible teaches it's a free gift. If you accept with your whole heart this free gift, if you would turn away from sin in your life and call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. And now you understand what you'll be saved from. Your sin will be forgiven and forgotten, the Bible says. And you will be reconciled with God. In one moment, the eternal hell that you deserve will be replaced with eternal heaven you can never earn. And I feel for me in a moment, I'm going to kneel down here. And you know what? I am going to ask the Lord to forgive me. And you're free to join me if you want to. Because I've not shared this reality with the people in my life. I've not brought it before them. You know, the Bible would say Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. This is what it means. He as a perfect sinless man could come to the world and say, you know what? You all deserve to die. You all deserve hell because you sin and keep sinning against my Father, a holy and just God. You deserve what's coming your way. I condemn you. No, no, the Bible said, Jesus said, I will not condemn. I'll come to save you despite what you deserve. I can make a way for you to escape that reality. If you would take my hand, I will draw you out of that and I will bring you into my Father's house. I will save you. I've not come to condemn. I've come to save. 
But here's the reality. If we don't share that news by our silence, we condemn those Jesus wants to save. I can feel my flesh raging against this. I will give an account for every time I could have spoken the truth and I didn't. And so will you. And so I'm going to just kneel down and ask the Lord for his forgiveness. And you know what? Then pray for those in my life that the Lord will reach in and by his grace and his mercy perhaps use me to reach people in my life who do not know him. At least to bring the truth. 